All right, so what I want to start doing in this series of videos is covering the history of modern philosophy in a fairly standard way, uh, at least from the perspective of Dussel, from a Eurocentric uh, perspective and considering the beginning of modern philosophy as beginning with Descartes. Now, Dussel is going to argue against this, but I at least want to present this view. Uh, but there will be a little bit of uh, non-conventional sort of presentation in that I'm, I'm gearing things uh, towards understanding Marx, uh, which, you know, uh, often is not the, the case. Uh, but this all fits in with, you know, everything I've been constructing. So um, modern philosophy is, is considered usually to begin with uh, Rene Descartes with his discourse on the method uh, 1637, or at least with the meditations on first philosophy. Uh, and so I'm going to present a very Cartesian uh, version of uh, modern philosophy, sort of putting thing putting things in reference to Descartes as much as possible, but then also emphasizing some things that um, are related to Marx and um, and and I think this will get us, you know, a, a, a lot of important things that that we need to be aware of to understand Dussel. All right, so I wanted to cover uh, just some, some uh, background information. Uh, Anselm of Canterbury is a saint. Anselm is a saint of the Roman Catholic Church. Back early in the medieval period, uh, creates uh, a work called the uh, Prose Logion. And it's a pretty interesting piece of writing. It is the logic in it. I mean, it has the appearance of a very structured and logical argument. And so it's, it's intriguing and, and philosophers find themselves drawn back to it over and over again. Uh, and it purports to prove the existence of God. Okay, so it's a proof of the, it's like the standard proof of the existence of God from the Eurocentric, uh, perspective of philosophy and theology. Uh, this is well before the Protestant Reformation, so this is Roman Catholic, like, uh, uh, um, really this is more before Aristotelianism takes hold, and so Anselm is more of like a, a Neoplatonist Aristotelian uh, in the way that I've, I've sort of discussed about the Arabic philosophers. Um, earlier on. Uh, so, so the argument is this, is that, you know, you have an idea of God. So let's define the concept or the idea of God. And the essence of that is that God is that than which uh, nothing is greater. That than which nothing is greater. God is the, the top thing. Like, so it's a really simple definition. So whatever is the greatest thing, that's God. Okay. Now, where the question is whether God exists, is there a greatest thing? And he says, well, if something exists, it's greater than, it's better than something that doesn't exist. Therefore, God must exist because God is the greatest. Okay, so it's like it, it almost works. You almost want to go there, uh, but it doesn't quite, um, doesn't quite um, work out. Okay, but it's, but it's nonetheless intriguing to kind of try to get your head into that way of thinking. And so what Anselm is claiming is that existence can be deduced from essence, from the definition of God, 
what God is essentially in this Aristotelian and even a Platonic sort of way, uh, the idea of God, so this is the Plat uh, Platonic way of saying it, more along the lines of what the language that Plato actually used. You have the idea of God, and, and if you properly define that idea in the way that Socrates was always challenging people to do is really define their ideas, the very definition of God implies that God must exist. Okay. Um, it, it's never really satisfied anyone, even immediately, like when Anselm published this, immediately there's a whole train of, of criticisms, uh, but then, and then, you know, but then uh, in, in uh, but then that all just part becomes part of the work. Uh, it's not just what Anselm says, but then there's these objections and then Anselm replies to those objections. So it's the whole problem of trying to deal with Anselm's uh, basic setup that's very intriguing. Um, and, it's, and it's not too hard to understand, right? So, so that's what's kind of nice about it. It's, it's kind of simple, but it kind of seems, you know, you can kind of think it through, even if you're not like uh, super uh, into philosophy or theology, you can kind of get on board. All right, so um, I, I, I wanted to look at this. Uh, these are kind of just odds and ends. Uh, and you'll see that this section here, uh, you know, this series of lectures is maybe a little uh, looser than, than my other stuff because I'm kind of rethinking things in light of what I've read recently about Dussel that I want to emphasize for you. So I'm, you know, it's uh, turning in my head. Okay, so, uh, but this is just a uh, sort of loose end that I didn't show you elsewhere, but uh, Moyer uh, wrote this play, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, um, which is the bourgeois gentleman. And, you know, here's a, an actual, poster for the for a performance and we get the image uh you know from the french perspective now moye is french and this is why i didn't really have a place to to bring this up before but we've started talking about the french revolution uh, and and how that's going to feed into the bourgeois revolution later in the 19th century or is already beginning with the French Revolution, but uh, but this is a you know he's a comical character, the bourgeois gentleman. He's wearing you know there's like too much bling. He, he's a, a nouveau riche and trying to pretend like he's of nobility, but he's not of nobility because he's just a bourgeoisie. He's a commoner, and um, and and then the whole play, which is a play written for nobility and for the monarch, you know, to be performed in court and for high society. They're making fun of this, this upstart. Yeah, he's wealthy. He's a wealthy businessman, but he, he has no class and, he, and he's ultimately stupid. Um, he's a, just a comical buffoon. And so, uh, you know, we, we get this, uh, this sort of image and, and that still that derogatory sort of um, connotation is there in the Marxist usage uh, of the term. Yeah, so that's something to, something to think about. Mm. So did I get back to the right place? Okay, looks good. All right, so, and then, um, and then, uh, oh, I see, I'm not quite on the right tab. Uh, but uh, the only thing I wanna mention here is just Francis Bacon. Um, he wrote a book in 1620. So this is not too long before Descartes, uh, the new organon or the true directions concerning the interpretation of nature. So Francis Bacon's approach, he, he's trying to create 
an approach or a methodology for scientific investigation. So he's thinking philosophically of, of like phil uh, scientific methodology. And then Rene Descartes comes along and writes a book very much on the same questions, uh, but takes it in a different direction. So we just see that this is kind of something that's that's part of the the times is people are thinking about science the scientific you know copernicus is already published and uh kepler but we haven't gotten to galileo yet uh and of course we haven't gotten to descartes and we haven't gotten to isaac newton uh, but people are starting to talk philosophers are starting to talk about science and how do we do science and how do we know that our methodology is really getting us solid results? And of course, the problem is, is that if, if you're coming out of a, an atmosphere of Aristotelian uh, scholasticism, uh, Aristotelian scholasticism was all about, well, let's look at the, the way that we talk about things, let's, let's uh, clearly define ideas, and then let's conceptually analyze those uh, ideas and there's not there's not really an intention or desire to go out in the world and see if you know your analysis really matches up with the real world but it's becoming clear to philosophers that oh part of scientific knowledge is okay you do an analysis but you have to match it up with the real world and you have to go out and make observations and you have to test things out in the real world in some way. And that's all very hazy to them. Uh, Francis Bacon, you know, if you read this is, is not, um, you know, he's, he's like between two worlds. He's between Aristotelian scholasticism and then what we would think of as scientific uh, discovery. And he's really this kind of figure that's on the cusp. So that's just something uh, interesting to mention. All right, I'm going to cut this video off here and I'll see you in the next video.